The earth shuddered twice in less than a day, first in the humid equatorial seas north of Australia, then in the freezing waters between South America and Antarctica. Two powerful tremors, one near Abapura, Indonesia, and another in the Drake Passage, erupted almost back to back, echoing a growing global restlessness along the planet's most volatile tectonic boundaries. Could these twin jolts be a sign that the Pacific's sleeping giants are stirring? Might the long-awaited big one be preparing to strike where silence has lasted too long, in Cascadia, Chile, or Alaska? The answers are buried deep in the mechanics of the shifting crust itself, written in the grinding collisions that sculpt the face of our planet. Early on October 16th, two seismic alarms went off. The first quake struck at about 5.48 a.m. UTC, centred roughly 194 kilometres, about 120 miles, west-northwest of Abapura, Papua, Indonesia. It measured magnitude 6.5 and occurred at a depth of about 35 kilometres, 22 miles. The U.S. Geological Survey recorded it as an undersea event in a very active zone where the Australian and Pacific plates meet. The shaking was felt as far as Jayapura, but at that depth the energy dispersed enough to prevent serious damage. No tsunami alert was raised. Just hours earlier, another tremor shook the opposite side of the planet. At 1.42 a.m. UTC, a magnitude 6.3 earthquake ruptured beneath the icy Drake Passage a forbidding stretch of ocean between Tierra del Fuego and the Antarctic Peninsula. It was shallow, only ten kilometres, about six miles, deep, and its location made it particularly interesting. The Drake Passage is not a frequent producer of deep or destructive quakes, yet it sits on a complicated boundary between the Antarctic, Scotia and South American plates. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center briefly issued, then cancelled, a regional alert after confirming that sea level changes were minimal. Even so, its proximity to the same region that produced a magnitude 7.6 quake only six days earlier raised eyebrows among geophysicists tracking global seismic clusters. What makes these paired events noteworthy isn't just their magnitude. It's a story they tell about how energy moves through Earth's outer shell. In Indonesia's case, the epicentre west-northwest of Abepura lies within the Papua Fold Thrust Belt, a massive system of compressional faults that record millions of years of tectonic violence. Here, the Australian plate continues to collide with several small Pacific microplates, squeezing, folding and breaking the crust. This region is a geological crossroads, where converging forces twist old faults back to life. In some places, faults that were once subduction zones have become reactivated, releasing energy long stored in the rocks. The latest event most likely represents thrust faulting along one of these structures, where layers of crust were shoved over each other. Unlike the deep megathrusts of Sumatra or Java, this quake occurred within the upper plate itself, an intraplate adjustment responding to the slow but relentless convergence of continental and oceanic material. The mechanism was dominantly compressional, a type of motion that can still produce tsunami hazards if it deforms the seafloor, though in this case the rupture was too deep and offset from the trench to push large amounts of water. It serves, however, as another reminder that New Guinea and eastern Indonesia sit in one of Earth's most geologically complex and restless corners, a mosaic of small plates, shear zones and folds where no region is ever truly quiet. The Drake Passage quake, on the other hand, represents the cold opposite of the same process, a boundary defined more by sideways tearing than head-on collision. 
Between the Antarctic and South American plates, the Shackleton Fracture Zone acts as a transform fault, accommodating lateral motion. Yet portions of it retain a subtle compressional component where the Scotia plate interacts with fragments of the Nazca and Antarctic plates. That mixed regime allows both strike slip and thrust earthquakes to occur, a hybrid tectonic style rarely found elsewhere on Earth. The recent cluster of large quakes here, including magnitudes 7.4 in May, 7.5 in August, and 7.6 on October 10th, followed by this 6.3, suggests a prolonged phase of strain release along this complex system. Each of these events slightly rearranges the stress field of the surrounding crust, redistributing energy that might have been locked for decades. The proximity and time between these southern quakes hints at a regional readjustment of the plate boundary, possibly triggered by cumulative motion between the Nazca and Antarctic plates. However, this sequence should not be confused with direct triggering. Large earthquakes rarely cause others thousands of kilometres away. Instead, they express a synchronised response to the same global dance of plate motion. The sequence of recent large earthquakes around the Pacific, from the magnitude 7.8 in Kamchatka, Russia, in September, to a 7.3 off Alaska in July, and a series of seven-point events in the Philippines and Papua New Guinea earlier in October all illustrate a planet releasing built-up tension in bursts rather than evenly. The Earth's lithosphere is segmented into plates that move at rates of a few centimetres per year, roughly the speed at which fingernails grow, but the energy they accumulate at their margins is released in seconds when a fault ruptures. That's what we witnessed in both the Indonesian and Drake Passage events, sudden localised stress drops within systems already under immense pressure. To understand why these quakes matter, one must consider where they didn't happen. Along the vast Cascadia subduction zone, stretching roughly 1,000 kilometres, about 600 miles, from Northern California to Vancouver Island, silence reigns. The last truly massive rupture occurred in January of the year 1700, estimated at magnitude 9, which sent a trans-Pacific tsunami to Japan. Since then, the zone has been eerily still, producing only small tremors. The few recent offshore events, a magnitude 5.9 and a 5.1 off the Oregon coast in late September, were too weak and too distant to signify major change. Geophysicists regard this quiet not as safety, but as warning. A locked subduction zone is like a compressed spring. The longer it stays stuck, the more energy it stores. When it finally releases, the rupture can extend for hundreds of kilometres and send towering tsunamis across the Pacific. Recent imaging of the Juan de Fuca plate beneath Cascadia has revealed that it may be fracturing and peeling away in segments, an internal disintegration of sorts. Portions appear to be sinking into the mantle faster than others, creating uneven coupling along the megathrust. Some regions might creep aseismically, moving quietly, while others remain rigidly locked. This fragmented behaviour might explain why Cascadia is so quiet on the surface. The stress is being unevenly absorbed and hidden. Yet that makes the threat no less real. When the locked segments finally rupture, they could produce one of the most powerful earthquakes in North America's history, accompanied by a tsunami capable of devastating coastal communities. A similar tension exists in Chile. The subduction of the Nazca Plate beneath the South American Plate is one of the most consistent and powerful geological processes on Earth. It has produced many of history's largest earthquakes, including the record-setting magnitude 9.5 Valdivia event in 1960 and the catastrophic 8.8 .8 in 2010. 
Chile's coastline, stretching about 4,300 kilometers, 2,700 miles, is a continuous collision zone where the oceanic plate plunges beneath the Andes at a rate of about 8 centimeters, 3 inches, per year. Over time, this relentless convergence loads immense stress onto the interface between the plates. In recent weeks, Chile has experienced a swarm of smaller quakes, between magnitude 4 and 5.9, but no major release. This uneven pattern may indicate that certain segments of the megathrust remain locked, building toward another major rupture. Historical patterns show that great quakes often repeat along similar stretches after intervals of 50 to 150 years. The northern Chilean coast, for instance, has not experienced a major event since the late 19th century, making it a region of special concern. When it eventually breaks, it will almost certainly produce a tsunami capable of crossing the Pacific within hours. The quiet there, like in Cascadia, may be deceptive, a calm masking massive potential energy. Alaska's story, meanwhile, is one of continuous but uneven release. The Aleutian Arc marks the subduction of the Pacific Plate beneath the North American Plate, and it has a long history of generating giant earthquakes. The magnitude 9.2 quake of 1964 remains the most powerful ever recorded in North America, reshaping coastlines and sending a tsunami across the Pacific. More recently, in July of this year, a magnitude 7.3 struck near Sandpoint, about 85 miles southeast of King Cove, at a shallow depth of roughly 15 kilometers, 9 miles. A tsunami warning was briefly issued, though only a minor wave of a few centimeters was detected. This consistency of mid to large magnitude earthquakes in Alaska shows that its subduction interface is active and capable of frequent partial ruptures. Each one relieves some stress locally, but does little to prevent future great quakes along adjacent locked segments. The subduction rate here, around 60 millimeters, two and a half inches per year, guarantees that strain builds quickly. Like Chile, Alaska's coastal communities remain perpetually at risk from both shaking and tsunamis. Across all these regions, a unifying theme emerges. The Earth's plates are redistributing stress through a series of independent but interrelated events. These are not direct triggers. A quake in Kamchatka does not cause one in Indonesia, but they are part of a broader cycle of global adjustment. As the Pacific Plate interacts with its surrounding neighbours, small shifts can influence how stress accumulates along distant boundaries, setting the stage for future ruptures. The recent cluster of earthquakes along the Pacific Rim in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Kamchatka, the Drake Passage and Alaska fits into this cyclical pattern of global energy release. The potential for tsunamis remains a constant companion to these processes. Shallow undersea quakes that displace the ocean floor can push columns of water outward, generating waves that radiate for thousands of kilometers. In Indonesia and Chile, such events are an ever-present danger. The depth of the Abipura quake and its inland location spared nearby coastlines this time, but a similar rupture closer to the trench could have produced waves reaching regional shores within minutes. In the Drake Passage, the mix of shallow thrust and transform faulting creates unpredictable hydrodynamic effects. The relatively confined ocean basin can amplify even modest displacements. Each event reminds us that even small vertical movements of the seafloor measured in meters can translate into devastating waves once unleashed. Ultimately, what ties these scattered events together is not coincidence, but continuity.
Earth's lithosphere is in constant motion, its vast plates colliding, diving and grinding past each other in a cycle that has shaped continents, built mountains and torn oceans apart. The quakes of October 16th, one in the equatorial Pacific, one near the edge of Antarctica, are simply the latest expressions of this ceaseless motion. They reveal nothing supernatural, yet they speak volumes about the forces shaping our planet and the inevitability of future catastrophes where strain continues to build unchecked. So, are these the precursors to something larger? Not necessarily but they are warnings. They remind us that the tectonic machinery beneath us is awake, that stress is shifting from one boundary to another, and that no region along the Pacific Rim can remain quiet forever. Cascadia, Chile and Alaska may be silent for now, but their geological clocks are still ticking. Whether the next big one strikes tomorrow or centuries from now, the mechanisms driving it are already at work, deep beneath the crust. In the end, these quakes reaffirm what science has always known. The earth never truly rests. Beneath the calm surface, enormous slabs of crust slide and collide with the power to reshape entire regions in seconds. The lesson is one of humility and preparation. We cannot stop the plates from moving, but we can understand them, and by understanding, we can be ready when the next great rupture arrives. So, as we watch the ring of fire rumble once more, the message is clear. Vigilance, not fear. The danger zones of Cascadia, Alaska and Chile remain poised between silence and fury. And though today's tremors may fade from headlines, they are part of a far older rhythm the heartbeat of a restless planet. If you found this report informative, don't forget to like, share and subscribe and tap that hype icon to help this video reach a wider audience. The more people stay aware of Earth's seismic rhythms, the better we all prepare for whatever comes next.